So, in this tutorial, you're going to be learning about the life cycle of a star, or how a star goes from... So, to go back to our original star, we start off with our stellar nebula, which becomes um, a protostar, then a main sequence star, then a red giant, then a planetary nebula with the shells of gas being given off, and a white dwarf. And these are the bits that you need to know looks like this, a cloud of dust and gas, to something that looks like this, a giant ball of burning plasma with a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin and a core temperature of about 15 billion degrees, and eventually end up as this, a planetary nebula, one of the most beautiful objects in the universe, with shells of gas and um, different elements being given off and a remaining white dwarf right in the centre just here. So what you need to be able to do is you must be able to describe the evolution of stars of similar mass to the Sun through the following stages. You need to follow them through a nebula, um, a main sequence star, red giant and white dwarf. So let's go through that first. Okay, the next thing we need to be able to do is describe, really is this, is how, describe how the evolution of stars with a mass larger than the Sun is different, and it may end in a black hole or a neutron star. So let's go and do that. The, the, the stars that are bigger than our Sun are, have a different life. They start in the same way, from a planetary nebula, sorry, from a stellar nebula, which then becomes a protostar. And then fusion begins and they beca start becoming um, what, they, what is in the main sequence, I guess, because it's, called, it's fusing hydrogen together, but they become slightly different. So this is a nebula, um, and this is specifically called the, I think it's either the horse head or horse shoe nebula. Um, generally astronomers name things because they can't think of any better names. But you can see that there are stars um, forming in this nebula, and you can see that there's a huge cloud of something. Now, this guy, the something is actually dust and gas, and then when you say gas, it's mainly hydrogen. And over millions or billions of years, this hydrogen will pull itself together under the force of gravity. Okay, and over millions of years, uh, as these, this dust and gas comes together, it will form a protostar. Now, a protostar is what you see on the screen in front of you. And it's essentially a swirling cloud of dust and gas which is being pulled together under gravity. This is heating up as gravitational energy, gravitational potential energy, becomes kinetic energy, and then becomes heat. When it reaches a hot enough temperature, so about 18 million Kelvin, it will start fusion. And when it starts fusion, it stops being a protostar and it becomes a star. This phase is now known as the main sequence for any average sized star like our sun. Our sun is in the main sequence phase of its life. In the main sequence phase, it is burning or fusing hydrogen. And as it fuses hydrogen, it creates helium. Eventually, the hydrogen runs out. And when the hydrogen has run out, the star has no more fuel. So, fusion stops. And when fusion stops, gravity wins. The star collapses in on itself. But as it collapses, it heats up again. And when it heats up again, it restarts fusion. But this time it's not fusing hydrogen, it is fusing helium. The star swells up and cools down and becomes a red giant. 
Now you can see how much the star swells on this diagram. The type of stars that are on this particular slide are known as Kepler red giants and you can see that they are um, not in fact that much bigger than our Sun. Our Sun will probably become much bigger than this. But they are bigger and they are cooler as well. If you look at the temperature, it is in fact less. 5,800 Kelvin for our Sun is about 5,500 degrees centigrade. Um, 5,000 Kelvin for the smallest Kepler red giant is about 4,700 um, centigrade or Celsius. And the same thing for the Kepler red giant, um, it's about 4,200. So it's considerably cooler than our Sun, but it is much, much, much bigger. Um, this phase will last for a billion years, and in this phase, the star is fusing helium. Now, this suffers from the same problem as the main sequence star, in that one day, the helium runs out. And again, the pressure from inside pushing the star outwards against gravity will then stop, because there's no fusion going on, there's no energy pushing outwards. So again, gravity wins. And for the last time, the star will collapse. Now before it does that, it actually undergoes a few different changes. First it puffs off shells of gas into space. This is an actual image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a currently dying red giant, and you can see at the edge of the picture here, um, the shells of gas being given off, and at the centre, still a very bright star. When this phase finishes, the center of the star will, dis will extinguish, it will become much, much less bright, but the shells of gas will remain um, moving outwards from where the star was. And we end up with something like this. So we have our shells of gas on the outside. Now these are made up of lots of different elements, not just hydrogen and helium, but everything the star fused together during its red giant phase. If you fuse hydrogen together, you get helium. If you fuse helium together, you get the heavier elements. You get things like lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the way up to iron. And uh, so these shells of gas are full of these different elements. And this has now become a planetary nebula. so-called because people used to think that this is where planets came from. It's since been proved that actually planets can come from a variety of different places, from a variety of different clouds of gas, but they can certainly come from these planetary nebulas. And actually, in certain photos, you might be able to see um, plan uh, new stars and planets being formed out of the remaining dust and gas that's being given off by this red giant. Now, at the very centre, left behind, is the cooling core of this star, and this is a white dwarf. It's still hot because it was the center of a star, and the center of the star is about 15 billion degrees. That energy just doesn't disappear, it's got to be lost over a number of years. So the white dwarf is still hot, but over billions of years it will cool down and it will eventually become a black dwarf seen in this artist's impression. Now it's an only an artist's impression because of course you can't see black dwarfs. Why not? Because they don't give off any light. It's impossible to see something against a black, uh, black background when it doesn't give off any light. So we rarely see black dwarfs. So the first stage is the same. We have the stellar nebula which becomes a protostar. But then we get to this phase. Once um, fusion begins, the star becomes what we know as a blue giant. Why is it called a blue giant? Well, it's giant and it's blue. It's roughly the same as our sun and other main sequence stars in that it's fusing hydrogen. But because it's so big, it runs out of fuel quicker. And so its life is much shorter than our sun or smaller stars. At the end of the blue giant's life, it will run out of hydrogen in the same way that a main sequence star. So it runs out of hydrogen, gravity wins, and the star collapses. But of course, when it collapses in on itself, it doesn't just collapse, it also starts fusing together helium again. The star swells up
cools down and becomes a red giant. But in this case, because it's already giant, it was a blue giant, it can't just become a red giant, it also increases in size. So instead, it becomes a red supergiant. Now here are examples of two red supergiants, Antares and Betelgeuse, which are both in our galaxy and are some of the brightest stars in the sky. Now what we have down here, Rigel, is a blue giant. And it will eventually swell up and become a red supergiant, very similar to Betelgeuse. Now if you see down here, here is our sun. One pixel on this tiny on this picture. Betelgeuse is so large it would probably swallow up the entire solar system. At the end of a red supergiant's life, it does almost the same thing as a red giant. These red supergiants are burning so hot, and remember, as the star collapses, it increases in temperature. But in this case, the temperature increases so much that it can fuse together everything that was formed before. The star initially forms fuses hydrogen together to form helium and then helium together to form the other elements as we said from lithium beryllium carbon neon, nitro, um, sorry nitrogen neon etc onwards um, up to iron the star can't form fuse together iron unless there is an incredibly high temperature and that is generated inside a red supergiant when it collapses Everything falling into the core pushes everything together so tightly that even iron starts to fuse together and it fuses together all the other elements. Everything up to uranium. And all the energy released from this fusion results in a massive explosion. I can't really show you a supernova explosion unfortunately, but we can show you the aftermath in something like this. Now this is the remnants of a supernova that exploded about 10,000, sorry, about 1,000 years ago and it has now become the Crab Nebula, as we know it today. Now on this picture, you can see webs of material that have been thrown out by this supernova. Um, gas and dust and iron and zinc and copper and nickel and molybdenum and titanium, etc. All these elements have been created inside this supernova explosion. Now this is about 40 light years across, so from um, here to here is about 40 light years. But what's weird to me is that, of course, if we get rid of this, these big arrows that are on the middle, you cannot, in fact, see anything left at the middle. Where did the giant star that has now become a supernova gone? Well, if we look at the um, remnants of this supernova in um, telescopes that use other wavelengths, so for example, if we look at it in X-ray, then we start seeing a different picture. This is what's left at the center of the Crab Nebula, a neutron star spinning incredibly fast with jets of gas being pushed out at its poles. And an incredibly dense structure left at the center. Because remember, this is the centre of a supermassive star, a trillion or, a, well, sorry, a trillion, 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 trillion tonnes of hydrogen pushed down by gravity onto itself, onto all the other elements, and pushing them together, fusing them together into something incredibly dense and incredibly heavy. And we know this as a neutron star. Now this only happens to very large stars, but actually to the largest stars, what if the core that is left over is dense enough and compressed enough, then it can become a black hole. And this is all due to gravity. Will gravity be enough to force the elements at the centre of the red supergiant to become dense enough mass to become a black hole? So now, you need to pick three simple questions to answer. So, what is a light year? What will a star like our sun become at the end of its life? What two things can very large stars end their life as? What element do stars fuse in the main sequence? What is the name of the process that gives stars energy? What two forces are balanced if a star is stable? What is a nebula? 
and what energy changes take place in a protostar? Okay, and six mark questions. These are in order of difficulty. So the first one is actually from a foundation paper. Simply describe the life cycle of a star such as the Sun. If you're aiming for A and A star grades, you should be doing the last two questions, which are compare and contrast the future evolution of our Sun with that of a star with much higher mass. And finally, explain how and why a star changes from the main sequence to the red giant phase. Good luck.